right, the scripture reading for today is Psalm 23. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of the death, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff. They comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Amen. Here ends the reading. Amen. Thank you, Russ. Oh, you put the papers back in order. That's awesome. Well, you might notice this morning that I'm a little, you know, messed around because we're usually in another area in the church, and I usually have a big prompter to read from and all that, and my notes are prepared and put in front of me. Plus, this is my only, only my second time in the pulpit, so please forgive me. Uh, but we're going to get through this just fine because the Lord is with us. Amen? Um, what do we know about King David? Somebody, raise your hand. Tell me a little bit about King David, anybody. Yes. Huh? Uh, you're right. He, he, he was a sinner. What kind of sins did he have? He was a man after God's heart, but he sinned. What kind of sins did he do? Anybody know who Bathsheba was? <laughs> so he was an adulterer. What else was he? He was also a murderer. He, had, he wanted Bathsheba, so he had her husband killed and sent him off into battle and had him killed on the way. But he had a heart for God. Now, when we look at Psalm 23, and Drew has already been over this while he was going over this stuff, we're not sure about a lot of the Psalms, when and where they were written and stuff. We're pretty sure that the Psalm 23 was written by uh, King David. And this is when he was in the wilderness because he had to leave because he had a son, his third son, Absalom. Now, a son after his own heart because he slept with all of David's concubines, pretty much kicked David out of his kingdom, and while he was in the wilderness, Psalm 23 was written. So we have a relational text here because God is talking to David, but he's also talking to us personally. Um, also, we're saying that in our church, we don't want sin to get between you and your relationship with God. Amen? Amen. So David was a man after God's heart, but he was also a flawed human being. Correct? So... As he's in the wilderness and he writes this, we have two prevailing things that are happening. One, the Lord is my shepherd, that's uh, one, verses 1 through 4, and the Lord is my host. As we explore, uh, that's five, uh, verses 5 through 6. As we explore the verses, let's be mindful of the foreshadowing of Christ. The Savior, or the Mashiach, as the Jewish people call them, which means the anointed one. They knew that he would be coming. He was regarded by the Jews as the anointed one, a king, and he would come from the Davidic lineage who would save his people. This shows Christ once again written in a text long before his birth. Amen? So in Psalm 23, it, manif it manifests a universal appeal to those of us who have confronted difficult periods in our life, and it points to God's grace and strength for all generations. Kathy and I have lost um, a lot of relatives this year. We've been to a lot of funerals. I hope we don't have to go to any more. We have heard this psalm at every one of those funerals, and I'm sure you guys have too if you've been to a funeral. I don't know if you stopped to consider exactly what it meant or where it came from, but we're going to look a little bit um, at that today. The Lord is my shepherd. Is the Lord your shepherd? What is a shepherd? It's a metaphor. He's the leader of the flock. Who are, who are the flock? We are the flock. And as all things with God's grace, it's a choice. You can choose whether or not God is going to be your shepherd. Is the Lord your shepherd? Is Jesus Christ your shepherd and shepherding your life? Amen. Do you allow him to do so? Have you given yourself over to that in your heart? If you haven't, we invite you to do it here today. You can, in the back of the church, after we're done, we would love to pray with you. If you haven't accepted Christ and would like to do so today, please do. As a shepherd cares for his flock us, the flock, it's worth pointing out that David uses my rather than our as it personalized. The Lord is my shepherd. 
This is showing a relational relationship between him and the Father, but also for us because we have to look at it through our culture and our eyes, what that means to us now. So the Lord is my shepherd. He's your shepherd. He's your shepherd. David, he's your shepherd. So this personalizes it for him and for us. It's a relational uh, relationship that we have with God. God personally cares for us. David was a shepherd in his youth, so he knew well this metaphor. And as through his lineage, Christ comes to us as our personal shepherd. In John 10, it says, I am the good shepherd, Jesus said. I am the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. If you're sitting here, folks, you were dead before Christ came and saved you. You were going to die, and you were not going to go to heaven before you accepted Christ because Christ is the way and the truth and the life. If you haven't accepted that, I invite you to talk to one of us in the church, get with one of our small groups, explore the theology with Nate when he has the class. But he says, I shall not want. What is this? This implies that God takes care of his sheep and is often interpreted as both on earth and in the afterlife. I shall not want. Now, a lot of us talk about what we want and what we need. What's the difference between want and need? What do you think, Corey? Right. Yeah, you may want tickets to the Jaguar game, but that's not what you need. So the Lord does know what we want, and he wants what's best for us. So he fulfills those needs. Now, with Israel, he gave them, uh, while they were in the wilderness, it implies that God takes care of his sheep and that God gives protection and guidance for eternally for his flock, not just for the promises that he already made, but also for the new covenant. This is reminiscent of God's covenant with Israel and the provision, provisioning he did with them in the wilderness. What did he give them in the wilderness when they had no food? We call it from heaven. So make sure that when you're praying and you're asking God for stuff, just fulfill your needs if possible. He knows what you need already. You know, don't ask for the running lottery numbers, those kinds of things when you pray. Pray for things after God's own heart. Pray that I can love my wife like Christ loved the church. Love you, sweetheart. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. God tells us that the pastures are green at all times for his sheep. Because typically they wouldn't be. They would have to go from place to place to place. But what God is telling us metaphorically, we his sheep can take rest. There's no need for us to migrate for food or manna. He'll provide for us. He will give us what is needed or necessary. Again, we see the foreshadowing of Christ who gives living water even to the Gentiles as shown in John 4.10 to a Samaritan woman at the well. Anybody remember the story of the Samaritan woman at the well? Somebody say something about her. No? She had a lot of husbands. She had a lot of husbands. And he said, you were right you don't have a husband. You have many husbands, and the one you live with now is not your husband. So, right. Yes. She gave him water, and he told her, I will give you water, which you'll never thirst again. I will give you living water. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What does it mean to restore your soul? Fix it. Okay. Forgive your sins. Restore your soul. Give your soul rest. You know, we're so burdened by today's society because we have this fast media that's always giving us stuff every second. We don't get to slow down most of the time once we get up in the morning and we start our daily routines. We're not allowed to slow down. Your soul sometimes needs rest. It needs to be restored. The burdens of this world that hit you every day, you need to be restored. Great way to do that at the end of the day, beginning of the day, and throughout the day is to pray. Amen? Amen. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. What does that mean, that for his name's sake? For his name's sake, because he's made uh, a covenant with Israel, and he's promised them. And he, even in our struggles, when we are fulfilled by God, our good shepherd, God leads his sheep to paths of righteousness, meaning he brings his sheep to the most direct path to their destination. Amen? He doesn't take us all through these places we don't need to go. What is the destination that we're looking for? Salvation. The salvation of your soul. 
So God leads us, his sheep, in the paths of righteousness. He's bringing us to that destination. And he, he doesn't unnecessarily tire out his sheep to bring them to, the, to that place. For his namesake, meaning he keeps his promise and covenant with his flock. So God made a covenant with the Israelites. And then again, we look at the foreshadowing of Jesus. What did Jesus do? Made a new covenant with us. We just had communion and talked about it. Because he said, I am the way and the truth and the light. Yet even in the right path doesn't mean that you're not going to experience issues or troubles in your life. Amen? Amen? After all, a walk through the valley of the shadow of death comes with peril. It doesn't sound like it's going to be an easy walk, does it? We're going to face times like that. You're going you're to lose loved ones. We're all going to die physically. It's going to happen. Hopefully not today, but it's going to happen. You're going to have difficulties in life. You're going to have medical issues. I have them. Everybody in the audience, something's going to happen to you sometime medically at some point. But you can't have fear. We must walk with no fear. Why? Why should we walk with no fear? Because he remains with us and is faithful to us at all times. Now, I see the valley that he's talking about as literal for David and metaphorically for us. Death is not finite for Christians. And as we navigate the valley of our physical death, God remains with us to guide us and to guide him. There's a great zo song by Zach Williams called Fear is a Liar. Anybody heard that song? Some of the youth, because we took some of the youth to that concert. Do you remember that song? I got to tell you guys, I like both of those groups, but I'm really getting into Zach Williams' music right now. Fear, he is a liar. If you haven't do it, get to YouTube and look it up. It's a great song. Basically, it's saying, don't be ruled or deceived by fear, my brothers and sisters. You must fear no evil because Christ is in you and he is with you. I remember Pastor Chris a couple of three, four years back. I don't know how long ago it was. 2 Timothy 1.7. For God gave us a spirit not of fear, but of power, of love, and of self-control. Do you have power over your life? Do you have self-control? Do you practice that self-control? I know someone in here does because they just got an orange belt. Yeah. Um, it's not easy doing martial arts, guys. That takes a lot of discipline. So does getting up and doing the right thing every day. God says, or David says rather, your rod and staff, they comfort me. Shepherds would carry a rod and staff for what? Russ, put you on the spot. Keep the sheep in line. He would carry the rod actually to beat away the wild beast that would try to come up on the sheep um, and the staff to corral the sheep and keep them in line, to keep them close. And he does this because he's protecting the sheep from wild animals. He's also protecting us, metaphorically, from Satan. Okay? He's telling us that we re to remain safe from Satan's harm and that we, we can rejoice in the comfort that God remains with you in your life in a personal and intimate way, even though you're walking through the valley of the shadow of death. Because that destination is going to lead to your salvation. So you're going to be in that valley but your salvation is going to rescue you in the end. Amen? Amen? All right, I'm a little nervous. How am I doing so far? Hey, all right. <laughs> so the second half is a metaphor instead of the Lord is my shepherd. Now the Lord is the host. So in Psalm 23, verse 5, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. My cup overflows. The Lord hosts David at a banquet filled with his enemies and protects him from the evil. In those days, honored guests would go into a banquet. And prior to going in, uh, they would be given a cup of oil, olive oil, that was mixed with perfumes. Why do you think that was? What do you think they did with that? What do you think they smelled like a few thousand years ago? You're going to go into banquet hall, you better be smelling good. Because, you know, they didn't have deodorant and air conditioning and all the stuff that we en enjoy and uh, take for granted now. <laughs> Russ. Russ said it was a perfume bath. Pretty much it was. So on our guest's head would be anointed with oil by the host prior to enter entering into the banquet. It contained perfume that was mixed with olive oil. The overflowing cup symbolizes God giving the best to his child. The cup of salvation. In the presence of his enemies, God vindicates his child in the adversities of life while demonstrating his love to his sheep, his children. 
David, I think, was talking about this because his third son had kicked him pretty much out of his kingdom. He does become restored. And uh, just so you know, try not to be too vain because Abs Absalom was known to be the best-looking man in all of Jerusalem. Yeah. <laughs> not really when you look at what happened to him. So, verse 6, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Now we are definitely getting into eternity. This shows God, or Yahweh, giving the goodness and love covenantially and faithfully to his servants. Servant. So both to his servants, everyone, and to you individually. He blesses us to abundance. This can but doesn't have to be monetarily. There are going to be some people who are going to make a lot of money in life. And you're going to see in your life bad things happen to good people and good things happen to bad people. You still have free choice as an individual. And your soul is yours to give to God. And if you don't give it to God, you're giving it to somebody else. Amen? Amen. So, again, this is more foreshadowing. In Revelation 7, verse 15, John writes, And he who sits on the throne will shelter them in his presence. They shall hunger no more, neither thirst any more. The sun shall not strike them, nor any scorching heat. For the lamb in the midst of the throne will be their shepherd. And he will guide them to springs of living water, and God will wipe away all the tears from their eyes. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for the love and the joy that you give us today. Please bless us, Father, that we might show that when we leave here. That we don't just come on Sunday for an hour and enjoy the music, though it's fantastic. And bless us that we show that love outwardly and that people see the joy and love of Christ in us as we interact with the world. Greater is he who is within me than he who is within the world, Father. I ask that you would bless everyone that's here today who is having problems or issues in their life, that you would bless them and be with them as they walk through the valley of the shadow of death. As in all things, we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen.